welcome back to Financial Planner Life. Today I have got Gillian sat with me and I'm so excited. This is my first episode of 2023. And traditionally, Gillian, I talk to people about what they do with the environment or sustainability. But the more I talk to people in the profession, the more I realize that there's so many more stories that need to be shared. And in terms of thinking about sustainability, it covers so much more than the environment in a business you've got to be sustainable with how you look after your employees how you develop your employees and that's led me into thinking about talking to people like yourself about their experience within financial planning particularly when it comes to mental health um so welcome today Gillian how are you I'm good thanks for having me You're welcome. Welcome. I'm sure the listeners will definitely be able to identify with parts of your story. I know when we've spoken before, I've been sat there like I know other people and particularly women have experienced similar situations to yourself. So I think it's always good to introduce to the listeners who we're speaking with today. So take it away, Gillian, and share with us a little bit about how you got into financial planning. Okay, so I was very, very young, uh, straight out of school, to be honest, and I applied for two jobs. I applied for a job at a solicitor's and a job at Scottish Equitable as a junior. And I did get offered them both. um, And I realised that the Scottish Equitable route, for me, probably had more career paths than a legal secretary. Um, So I started, I was like two weeks off, 17 years old, and I started at Scottish Equitable, which is now Aegon, I'm sure you know, which is uh, in 1990, that was. So I've been in financial services since 1990. I've been an admin. I've been a group personal pensions administrator. I started para planning quite early on before para planning was really a thing, sort of 1994, 95. Um, And then I went on to advise for a little while, did that for a while, uh, found that quite hard being a single parent, had a break, went to college, studied acting, got a degree in performing arts and came back to the profession again as a paraplanner. And I've been back ever since doing that. Oh, that's a good number of years as a paraplanner. And I love how you noticed that as well. There is definitely, there was a time where paraplanning was not really termed paraplanning. And then all of a sudden it was paraplanning. When was it you noticed that shift? My boss came up from a London meeting and said, oh, he says, down there, you know, he says they're calling them paraplanners. (laughs) Paralegal, like paramedics in London. And I said, oh, right. He says, that's what I'm going to call you. Oh, that there, yeah, uh, yeah. So that so that's what I'm going to call you, and I said, "Oh, right, okay." And it was <laughs> another five years before it actually became circulating in the in the sort of as a job title. Yeah, yeah. I still get it when um, I see it on LinkedIn sometimes, and people, say, you know, when you've got drop down menus of what job you are, when power planners on there, power planners are like, "Yeah." We do. We celebrate. We celebrate very much, very much. There was a team of para planners once on the TV quiz show Eggheads, and they oh, were, they were the para planners. I was like, yes, they're para planners. Finally, um, Finally. And, you know, so crucial to the profession as well. So so crucial. And I guess for yourself at this point as well, being a para planner, what does that? How does that align with your values in terms of your values as an individual and the service that para planning brings? Because I think it's. As a, in my day job as a recruiter, I talk to people a lot about their values. It's very value driven. And I find to be a power planner for that number of years, it's got to align deeply within you somewhere to just continuously want to keep doing it. I find it quite a creative uh, profession and I find it quite an intuitive profession because every client is different, as you know, every situation is different. And at the moment, I'm an outsourced power planner, so I'm dealing with many different advisors, many wow. different templates and how they want it doing and which calculations they want in there. And I find it quite challenging, so I think that's why I keep doing it. Yeah. And also, I like to sleep at night, so I like that the ultimate responsibility of the advice it is the advisors and not mine. <laughs> <laughs> it's not brain surgery at the end of the day. I say that to myself, not to power planners, by the way, that as a recruiter, I always say it's not brain surgery. It's fine. Like, I, again, I like to sleep. I like to have that time where I can just switch off. I take my hats off to the people who are the brain surgeons. As someone who's been in the profession since 1990, then you've probably seen a lot of changes come through. What have been the most notable for you? Uh, no, most, most notable changes. 
I would say the expansion of the para planning profession, the career. Um, the requirement now for para planners, a lot of companies are wanting us to be level four, so that we're at least as qualified as the advisors giving the advice. That's a big change. Um, it wasn't. It was more your experience um, in the past and now they're definitely looking for the qualifications to have under your belt to go into the into the profession which I think is a really good idea yeah definitely. I, I, I was sort of thrown in at the deep end and learn on the job kind of thing which is also valuable um, but I think the technical side of it really helps to apply the, the knowledge to the client yeah, definitely. I've noticed it myself that some of the larger corporate firms that I work with are very specific. They're like, no, you need to have your level four. But I think there is flexibility with people like yourself who have grown through the profession. Yeah. <laughs> You're not going to take someone who's got 20 years power planning experience and doesn't have their level four if you need a good quality power planner. That has been the main change. Um, but I think the main thing I noticed for me regarding work-life balance was when I was an advisor, when I had a small child, when I was a single parent, um, which is, I think when I came back from a period out of financial services, that value then was very important to have the work-life balance. It mo even more so when I came back from doing the uh, performing arts, I decided... I'd go back to financial services because it's what I know, but I must have this work-life balance as well because I'd learned that from previous. And non-negotiable. No, so, it's non-negotiable. Yeah. So what are your non-negotiables then? A work-life balance. What else is, in terms of looking for a new opportunity, what has to be met in your expectations? Oh, at the moment, it's the ability to work remotely. Mm. The ability to work flexibly in terms of, yes, I know I have a set amount of hours to do in a day, but I don't have to tr traditionally fill those hours nine to five. If I want to start at half past seven and finish at half past two, for example, I can, yeah. um, which allows me to structure my day around things that I might need to do for myself. Absolutely. Particularly if you've got children as well. You know, I I was raised by a single mum. Shout out to all the single mums out there. I honestly it it makes you out of tougher material for going through something like that and I don't understand the hours in the day that my mom would somehow find I always tell this story which um people <clears throat> found it really strange I was like do you never have ready salted crisps with your roast dinner and they were like no and I'm like oh is that just a single mum thing that she wouldn't put potatoes on and she'd just give us ready salted crisps like you get a bag each with your roast dinner and it's little things like that where looking back on it you just see that they're working the absolute hardest to give you everything that you have and there's just so much gratitude and I think work-life balance is so important because kids don't stay small forever they do grow yeah. up they do get yeah. bigger um, and I guess work-life balance, even in the last few years, has really changed. The pandemic really shifted More so. things. More and so. it, yeah, for the best as well, I think. I think it made people reevaluate where they were and what they were doing and what whether it was making them happy or not. And that, that was a big thing for me as well. And that's why I've ended up where I am. Yeah. yeah. And how do you find it working remotely? It can be lonely. Um, there are times when I just feel like I've got no friends kind of thing. Oh. <laughs> um, but I do voice that to my employer um, and they're putting in steps now to give me more contacts, maybe an IFA of my own where I'm the lead para planner so I have contact with other humans and things like that. So it's been quite tough the first six months while, while I've been, I've been there nearly a year now, but the first six months were really tough. Um yeah. I felt like I was talking to nobody and it was quite very quiet and quite quite depressing really. Yeah. You know, wondering whether I'd made the right the right choice. Mm. And we do, when things get tough, we do wonder like, is this the right choice? Am I going down the right path? But sometimes mm. the uphill struggle is you're just putting your your routine into place, you're figuring out your processes. And it's good that you've got that open dialogue with your employer because then they're looking at it like, oh, okay, we want people to work remotely. We want them to have the work-life uh, balance, but how can we support them more by having, you know, I, I couldn't imagine working remotely because I would talk to walls. Um, I think even on a day, at home when I'm working from home it gets to the afternoon and I'm like 
okay, I, I really need to go back into the office tomorrow and just like engage with everyone again. But for someone like yourself, where it's those non-negotiables mean that that remote job gives you everything that you need. Mm-hmm. Having support in there is so important. It is because at the moment, um, I'm going through um, a, a perimenopause, as they say, and sometimes I'm so tired. I just need to put everything down and just go and have a lie down for half an hour or an hour, oh. and then I can come back. If I was in an office, I don't think they'd appreciate me too. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, guys, I'm just going to go lay down over here. Yeah, <laughs> don't mind yourself. That's just our power plan and napping in the corner. <laughs> yeah. Power para planning nap. That's what it is. <laughs> I'm not sure how well that'd go down, but this job allows me to actually cope with what I'm going yeah. through as well. Definitely. In a, in a way. I think that's one thing. And just for people listening out there, I'm sure that there are people who might not actually know specifics of what perimenopause is. So is that the stage just before menopause kicks in? Yes, it's the period just before it can be two to five years um before your periods actually stop and you've not actually gone through the menopause until you've not had a period for a year so the whole time before that is the perimenopause so uh, i'm having the hot flushes i'm really tired i'm irritable grumpy sometimes um and i'm having a period every two weeks and i'm really tired <laughs> yeah i think with with periods it almost feels like a taboo word to say it out loud sometimes when you're talking in a professional sphere and that's something which i've definitely seen change in fact i remember when i had joined Recruit UK and Sam interviewed me he was like we have flexible working if one day you wake up and you feel like crap and you've got your period and I remember sitting there like oh you cringy just, you just said the word period like okay this is a company I want to work for because for me I think maybe it's a generational thing but I don't want something to be taboo if it's completely natural you know I remember I had this guy who I went to uni with every time he said the word period he went no 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 no, stop talking and I thought sorry this is completely natural it's something which shouldn't be you know disgusted you shouldn't be disgusted of it being in a, in a conversation um, yeah. and I think having that conversation in the workplace is so important and I think I mentioned to you before as well when Sam went to International Men's Day with St James's Place and did a massive group talk with the advisors there for Talk Club which is this charity that he's I think he's a trustee of it now it's to support uh, mental health within men because as we know I think the biggest killer of men under the age of 30 is suicide and I'm sure the stats still continuously get scarier even regardless of age Mm -hmm. and they did all their breakout rooms did their little talk clubs where they say how are you feeling out of 10 and they figured out that most of the advisors a key topic that they were struggling with was their wives going through menopause and being able to understand how to navigate that and so I guess I ask you as somebody who is in this situation right now what advice would you have for somebody who is potentially having to to help their partner or help someone they know or maybe they've got a colleague who's going through menopause what would your advice be for them to help them? My advice would be in the first place to go away and do a bit of reading at least so they've got a basic background understanding of what it is and the sort of things um, and how it can affect um, women and, and their hormones and then I don't like the word safe space but if, if a female knows that she can talk openly about that she's more likely to be open and speak about it if somebody's going to go ah period don't say that word then that's really them not understanding what what it is in my view um, and we do need to talk about it and um, so when you know, that the, the advisors are going home and the, their wives are tired and, and irritable, they maybe have got an inkling why and they can employ then a little bit of patience, a little bit of understanding and just an ear to listen. Um, I've, I've found a lot throughout my life with, with, with maybe more so with men that when, when you talk to them about a problem, their instinct is to fix it we talk about a problem because we just want to share and and feel better and know that we're not on our own. So I think maybe that's something they could take away from that is not try and fix her. She's not broken. She's just going through something, a life stage, and it won't be forever. You just need to be there. Absolutely. I I love what you said there, right? Why men try to fix it 
and it's not broken don't fix it she's just yeah. needing someone to listen and yeah. I think that's something which I actually use with my friends as well is sometimes I'll go into jump fix mode because I want to be there for them I want to support them and they'll be like Charlie you know thank you so much for your advice but I actually just kind of need you to listen and I'm like okay so sometimes I'll be like do you want me to listen or do you want my advice and posing that question also makes that person feel validated that you they have the choice do they need advice and they might not even think they need advice and but also they might not even think they need someone to listen maybe they do just need someone to listen to a bit of a shoulder to cry on and it is to this is another thing which I think is so important is just because it's natural doesn't always make it easy. Just because somebody goes through menopause and it's a totally natural process, it doesn't make it easy. And the same as if you're pregnant, you might come into lots of different problems with pregnancy. It might not be that blissful and enjoyable experience that women make it out to always be. So I think that's also worth noting that even when it comes down to periods, periods mm. can be really tough for people to go through. And having that understanding that as much as it's very natural and it does happen to our bodies, sometimes mm. it makes things a lot harder. Yeah. I mean, we can wake, I can wake up in the morning full of energy, feel really good, and I can get to maybe two hours later and I'm 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 tired and I'm thinking, what's wrong with me? And I'm I'm not understanding it and I'm not always connecting it to what's going on I'm trying to find some explanation and getting really angry because of what's going on and why am I like this instead of just going ah have a moment realize yeah. think it. and just accepting it and, and, and going with it instead of trying to fight it I think is is important as well I think horm hormonal like when hormones affect your mood it's almost like a veil comes over you and you can't gain perspective or clarity that it's your hormones mm -hmm. so when you think it's the end of the world and you're crying because you stubbed your toe and everything's going wrong and then the next day something happens where maybe your period comes you're like ah okay no I wasn't going crazy I was just join the dots yeah yeah join the dots yeah it's sometimes hard when you're going through it to, to realize and go ah it is this is what it is I can, I can mm -hmm. relax kind of thing yeah um, it's amazing how many times we go through it and then forget <laughs> what, what, what it is <laughs> I think it must just be a natural sort of female way of thinking about it I think it's just maybe it's that cathartic process that we need to be able to really find a grasp on it eventually um and I think it's important as well when you say that sometimes you have a little nap and then that lets you get up and do your work because to look after yourself, you have to be able to work in a sustainable manner. And as much as we all wish we could turn up and give 110% every single time, because we do have that passion and love for our career, I think it's also realistic that we aren't machines. And sometimes you've got to have a bit of a disco nap to rejuvenate yourself and be able to come back with much more energy. Because if you just kept powering through, particularly as a power planner, putting together reports, having to look at everything as a picture, that that could impact upon your work and that could impact yeah. on you inadvertently. And you don't want to feel like work suffering because of it. So I was talking to my stepmom about mental health when I was doing my mental health first aid uh, certificate. And she is a retired nurse now. So she's seen it all, done it all. Um, and she has five kids as well. She's been through breast cancer. She's had so much in life where she said to me, she's like, I must've had about three breakdowns, but I didn't really recognize that they were breakdowns. And I also didn't recognize it was my mental health. But I just thought to myself, at one point it's not normal that I can't get out of my pajamas and I'm just staying on the sofa all day I should probably go to the doctor and then when I'm so advocating for mental health and, and pushing it forward she's like it's still kind of alien I almost feel like because I suffered you should suffer but I know that's wrong <laughs> yeah definitely it's definitely a, um, a less taboo uh, subject like you say I I've had issues in the past. I've had a breakdown in the past. I was off work. That's when I took the time off work. Um, I knew I wasn't right. I was sort of having a bit of a burnout and everything was too much. And I took two years off and then I went back to school and, and studied performing arts, um, which it really helped my mental health, if, if, to be honest. Um, I had to get rid of all my diaries and things like that. Anything that I felt restrained me or made me do things at a certain time, I had to sort of get rid of that. I'm all right again now. I can cope with having an appointment. Um, but at one stage of life, I couldn't cope with having an appointment. Couldn't yeah. open the mail. Yeah. Couldn't take the rubbish out. Didn't want to do anything. So, yeah, I've been there. 
Yeah, me too. I remember I wouldn't like to pick up the phone to anyone. Um, that would be terrifying. My mum was always like, why did you never answer your phone? I do answer it more now, mum. Um, <laughs> uh, but I think it's one of those things where normal habitual habits just start falling and then you start stacking it on top of each other and you start feeling overwhelmed and I think within a workplace I'm very lucky at Recruit UK that they are very mindful of people's mental health and it's sort of recruitment with a conscience and that mm-hmm. element and Financial Planner Life really advocates it but for your experience through your career sort of 30 years of financial planning how has mental health mentioning in the workplace changed The place where I really noticed it change was a big corporation, sort of worldwide investment management company, and they were big on the mental health. Um, And when I when I experienced a colleague um, commit suicide at at their that particular place, um, they had uh, counsellors. They had a helpline. They had people coming in to speak to everybody in the office. Um, they were really advocating. They were quite happy if you needed to take time off, etc. cetera, because um, they knew what a big deal it was Yeah. Um, to, to, to lose a colleague like that. And, and I remember going into the office on the, on the morning of it happening before anybody told me, and I'm thinking the, the atmosphere was like, everybody was really quiet and really down. I was thinking, what's wrong? Yeah. You know? Um, and I, I was taken into this office and sat down and, and told told what happened. And I don't really know how to deal with it. That's my first experience um, of knowing somebody that had actually done that. Yeah. Um, and I did find it hard and I did end up leaving that company. Yeah. Um, uh, it was it was very hard, very painful. And being there every day just reminded me that that person wasn't, even though if I'm honest, I didn't get on with that person 100%. We had our issues. Um, But it was still too painful for me after that to work there. And that's part of the reason I left. So I'm of the mind, did I actually deal with that? Or did I just run away? Sometimes it, sometimes (laughs) dealing with it is leaving the situation, I think. Um, And I I think think it's, that's for me yeah, yeah it's so it becomes really like an internal conflict as well when you lose someone who's in your life who you didn't necessarily see eye to eye with like you wouldn't normally like pick up the phone and talk to them so when you speak to someone when you don't necessarily speak to them all the time they're not necessarily in your peripherals but then you lose them and all these fo- thoughts and feelings come up where you're like should I have spoken to them more? Should I have been there for them more? Should then- I have seen that he was in distress? Should I have offered a, an ear to listen? Would he have taken any notice anyway because of the way the relationship was? Ah, yeah. Yeah. And I think those are all very natural, like, emotions and questions come to the surface. And I think sometimes leaving that situation allows you to gain the perspective and the air and the space to be like, there are things that can be put into a workplace that can help people in that situation. But the hardest thing is for people when they're, it's almost a bit like hormones. When a veil comes over you, you don't think it's hormones. You don't want to reach out and ask for help. You don't know what's going on. I think when you're experiencing depression, sometimes you just don't want to ask for help. And sometimes you don't think you need it as well. You go almost into denial and you're like, oh, no, I'm fine. I'm just going to get on. Yeah. I think also with depression, because you're trying to just cope and carry on, you go into kind of an automatic pilot mode where you're just kind of doing things and living on a, you're existing rather than being present. You're just Mm. existing and you've got to recognise that then and, and, and try and get some help. Yeah. And I think it's interesting you took time and went into the performing arts because it's almost the most sort of it's like the opposite end of working in finance, really, isn't it? Because you've got this very strict regulated industry, lots of rules and regulations. And then you've got this industry where you can just do whatever you want. Um, and so I feel like that must have been a really big emotional release for you. It was. It was. I mean, a lot of the sort of 
talking therapies that, that I had when I when I was having my depression. What well, one of them was to to sit and think back the things that you used to enjoy as a child. Um, and one of those was was I wanted to be an actress. And my mum told me I should get a proper job. <laughs> so, so I didn't pursue it. Um, so that was the, the motivation behind that was, well, yeah, I, this is what I wanted to do. Why don't I go and see if I was any good at it? I'm all right. I've got an equity card. <laughs> <laughs> I love that as well. Going back to you know, I guess this is getting into almost like a areas of counselling and what can be brought up within counselling, making your inner child happy. Um, mm-hmm. And that's something which I've definitely, through Recruit UK and through a previous employer, is the only time I've ever been able to access talking therapy. And it's always mm-hmm. been at points in my life where I've absolutely needed it. And it's been, in my opinion, probably life changing, if not life saving. Mm-hmm. And looking at you know, your inner child and what makes your inner child happy. And now I almost feel like when I speak to certain people, like friends, colleagues, if I can sort of see their inner child in my eye, if I just think to them, me and you would have got on well in the playground, then I know that we're we're on that really genuine level with each other. Um, And I love looking at that. So I I love that you took that as, yep, I'm just going to go take some time, go into the performing arts. And how did you find it coming back into the profession then after leaving? It it was tough because we'd had all um, a day, um, and I'd sort of come out at that point when it was all changing, and then come back in. So when I left, we'd still got um, capped drawdown, and we'd still got the you had to have a certain amount of secure earnings before you had flexi drawdown, and all that kind of thing. So when I got back, everything had changed. Um, and it it was difficult. It was difficult. I read a lot of of pinks. Um, I read a lot of articles. Um, did a lot of reading last year's reports just to see. And you can, if if you've got a good power planner, you can see the changes as you're looking through. You can see the story, and you you can bring yourself up to speed. Um, and then tax tables and things like that. I mean, you can you know get them. From yeah. from anywhere, um, but everything had changed. Obviously, the null rate bands had changed. IHT had changed. Residents null rate band had come in, and it, it's ever evolving, as you know. So you do need to sort of keep up with it. But to me, it was the only thing that I knew that I felt that I was good at, besides the acting. And because I'd still got my mum in my head saying, "You need a proper job," um, that's why I went come back to financial services and I do the other stuff in my own time yeah Yeah. and ever since obviously progressing through to where you are today I think looking at mental health in the workplace I know we briefly spoke about ideas you'd I think you'd taken to your employer and be like let's see if we can implement this and firstly I commend you for that because I think taking ideas to your employer whether it's about work or about how to support employees is always quite daunting and there might be people out there listening who are business owners who are like no come talk to me please it's not that scary but there's probably people out there who are also like no it's it's quite terrifying because you don't want to overstep your mark you don't want to step on any toes but also if you think there's a good idea that might help you and also help others it's definitely Mm -hmm. worth speaking out about it so tell me a bit more about that Yes, so my husband was working as a support uh, engineer, a networking company, and they had a thing called a duvet day. And he came home and told me about this duvet day. And a duvet day is where you don't have to give your employer any notice or book a holiday or anything, but you just wake up that morning and you just you just can't face it It, it's just too much you just want to roll over in bed and pull the covers back over and just ignore everything um so what you would do is you'd email it into work or you'd ring into work and say i'm having a duvet day that's fine they don't question it they don't say or why or anything it's it's your duvet day now it does come off your holiday entitlement so not just going to give you a free day (laughs) free day holiday um and you only get one a year, so mm-hmm. it's that you use it if you really, really need it. So the temptation to use, oh, I'll, I'll use my duvet day and I'll just get a day off, it, it kind of gets rid of that because it's one day. 
Mm. Any other time you've got to take sick leave, you need a doctor's note or you've got to self-certify. Yeah. Um, or it's got to be a holiday day. Yeah, yeah. But a duvet day is when I've had these days, you just wake up and you just think, oh, I just, I just, I can't do it. You can do it, but you mm-hmm. can't emotionally, you just can't face it, you just can't do it. So I broached the idea of a duvet day. Uh, with my employer and he'd never heard of it <laughs> <laughs> it's quite a, a a sort of recent thing I think my partner also works somewhere where they give duvet days and I remember going what I could have done with those like four years ago <laughs> we need um, duvet days <laughs> I yeah they are I think as well with the duvet day the fact that it's just one day out of your holiday allowance means that it's not like you're putting some pushing something under the rug you know if you've got an issue in your life where you feel like you can't get out of bed multiple times that's a different conversation to have but everyone has days where they wake up and they think oh not today just not today and And I don't don't mean a hangover day either that's not when you use (laughs) that is not the purpose of it at all so it's not to be abused otherwise they're not they're not going to do it it's not going to be a thing um but I definitely think it's a good idea. Yeah, really definitely. Do. I think as well, you know, when people come into work, you are leaving so much personal stuff outside those doors and you never know what people are walking in with. As much as you know someone, you never know what someone's walking in with. And I think having a duvet day shows that, look, we trust you, we want you to be okay. And yeah. here is a day where if you just can't face it, you can't face it. And I think that is harder as well when you look at, for example, if you're an advisor and you're in a client facing role constantly, you know, mm-hmm. as a recruiter, if I'm having a bad day and I don't really want to talk to someone, I have, I've still got to pick up the phone and talk to people. I've still got to be that. I've still got to be on as Charlie. And I think it is a little bit harder. And there's probably, you know, brainstorming that could go around putting things in place for people in those super client facing roles. Obviously, power planners do go into the client facing world of it as well. And I think there are elements of all of the roles where you've got to be on that front level. But I think Mm -hmm. as an advisor, there is definitely also scope for them to create some level of an advisor duvet day where, you know, maybe they can just see their clients and take the afternoon off, have that flexibility, you know? Yeah. Or they just, you know, they do Zoom calls. Yeah. Day. You know, they're not out and about and they're not doing house visits or, or whatever it is that they need to just have that time. And mm. um, having the choice is just mm. you know, paramount. Yeah. yeah. I agree. I think, uh, we've been going through the B Corp pro- te- process. And if you've been listening to my podcast episodes, I know we've been going through the process for a while, <laughs> almost a year now, but we are so close to the end. And I highly recommend if anyone out there, or if even yourself, Gillian, want to know more about B Corp, um, my brain is full of it at the moment. And it is just about giving people the choice to look after their mental health. And recently we came up, we were trying to come up with how to incentivize mental health, which is a bit different. How do we ensure that people are actively engaging in their mental health and physical well-being and you know we were coming up with ideas like maybe we can do a tally every time someone does something that they set themselves a personal goal for if they reach their tally maybe we can take them to the local juice bar and get shots and a smoothie if people hit it really brainstorming over quite different things that might come into place might not to try and encourage people to really look after their well-being and I think as a manager when people bring these ideas to you If you don't have, you know, your business is made up of so many people. And if you've got five of a thousand at the top making the decisions, I can bet there is not somebody who represents every single person in that business at that table. And so to have these ideas come forward and have that collaborative contribution will help so many more people within the business, I think. I think if your manager or employer is sincere and lets you know that you can talk, you can come and maybe there's a suggestion box and it's anonymous or whatever, but there is a path for making these kinds of suggestions, then people are more likely to make them. If they think they're not going to be heard, then they're just not going to bother. Yeah, I agree. I think from doing my mental health first aid course, 
Um, I it's, it's it's pretty straightforward. It was a level two, maybe level three, I think. But I genuinely believe that every single company should have at least one person take it like a normal first aid course, particularly in managerial positions, because not only do you understand more about signposting and, and looking out for signs in your employees, but it's about creating that safe, inclusive space where somebody in the business will be that safe space for someone if that makes sense you know it will create that open dialogue because if you've got a very closed door policy then these things are going to get swept under the rug and then they can come out in a much uglier way than just someone saying can I just have a duvet day please yeah I think it's uh an evolving thing because like you say maybe 10 years ago you wouldn't have dreamed of maybe speaking to your employer about how you were feeling because what's that relevant to anything to, to you know to, in the old-fashioned ways as long as you're making them money they don't care and I think we need to get away from that thought that mindset that that's been in the past I think we need to move along like a paraplanner role which is now everywhere yeah. we need to evolve the the mental health space as well so that it, it's yeah. People are confident and, and secure that they can they're doing what they're doing and they're not going to get sacked because they're mental or you know something wrong with them or or whatever because these are the old stigmas these yeah. are the old way that people oh, if I say that they're going to think this about me and that's what we need to stop. Yeah, it's like our old limiting beliefs are, are what's going to stop us from moving forward and actually creating, you know, workforces that can be such positive forces for good. Um, and I think that's something which I really resonate with is turning a business into a power for good, power of positivity, because ultimately, you know, we can you can signpost people to Samaritans or Mind or all these different things. And as a business, that's like your own little hub of people where you can influence them and give them as much as you possibly can to help them in, in the office, but also outside of the office. And that will trickle through and sort of like a ripple effect, you know, through to the rest. If they can maybe have more mental health support in work, then maybe they'll be able to sit down and help their kids do their homework. And then, you know, maybe they'll be able to sit with their clients more who inadvertently helps their family. So all intrinsically links together as well, which is so beautiful. I agree. I agree. It's really yeah. good. Yeah. That space. Space yeah. to speak. Space to speak space to speak I mean even here sometimes we do um the girls come and grab me and they're like Charlie can we go do some journaling in the meeting room can we go do like a guided meditation and I think these things sometimes it might trigger people in a way of a certain language like oh you know they're going to meditate or they're going to journal or blah but actually just go sit in a dark room by yourself for five minutes that's all you need to do sometimes and I think particularly working from home do you have obviously you said you have your little like naps to recharge yourself do you have other ways of being able to bring yourself back off that ledge and into a zen zone uh yes I mean I'll go take the dog for a walk um get some fresh air leave the computer in the house take myself out the house um just sort of how do I describe it? It's being present in the moment, but away from the desk. Yeah. So going outside and realizing, oh yeah, there's a tree. For example, I don't want to sound all like tree huggy or anything, but that's a tree. I'm going to be <laughs> a tree. I'm going to be present in the moment. Yeah. This is now. This is happening. This is where I am. Yeah. I'm not going to worry about all that other stuff that I can't control, because it's just taking up energy that I've not got. Because I've got to just do what I'm doing yeah. so it's having that that mindfulness and that thought process as well to know when you need to take a walk mm. to know when you need to just switch the screens off for five minutes to yeah. know when it's just you're just flogging a dead horse kind of thing yeah. <laughs> um, it, it's having the tools and if your employer can give you the tools to recognize I think that's one of the first steps because yeah. sometimes like we don't recognize but if You've got an employer that's like done what you've done or done a course and is, is aware of these things. So much more dialogue and conversation and good things are going to come of that than than not at no speaking and no, oh well, I best go home and just speak to my husband about it because, you know, if I speak to my employer, I'm, I'm you know, I'm going to get a label on me and they're going to put a, a mark outside of my name in HR and yeah, 
people's minds when they're anxious they just make all these things up in their head and yeah. it makes it 50 times worse instead of just having a base and going right this is my problem this is what I need to do yeah I did you know I did this course with my employer we did this thing and I recognize it something's alarming in my head and, and this is what I need to do just giving the people the tools to to look after themselves and to recognize that they need to take time out and maybe go and have a shower or have a bath or have a walk or a cup of tea oh you know, cups of tea you know, nice gosh they saved me <laughs> i i know a hundred percent the tools and i think that comes back to education yes. of in the workplace what can you do to raise awareness and i think maybe it was last christmas we did um 12 days of recruit uk christmas and one of them was a mindful day so i think i did a journaling workshop somebody else did an affirmations workshop we did like a little bit of a yoga stretch and we just talked through and i said look this might work for you it might not I'm sharing what I do to help myself and mm. if it resonates with you it resonates with you and then ever since we did that people have come and grabbed me and been like can we go do that journaling again or can we go meditate and I'm like yeah of course and I think that's the thing is if people aren't shown what to do then they're going to be stuck in the same space almost their own echo chamber yeah and they're going to get more poorly if they're just yeah. stuck and not finding any way out so they need to be given the, the ways out. And once you've given people the ways and means to do something, they do it. They don't we don't want to feel like this forever. We want to, mm. you know, function. Absolutely. <laughs> it's the non-functioning that's the hard part. Yeah. And I think as well, you know, if there's somebody listening today who's thinking, oh gosh, this kind of mirrors my situation. I'm not feeling that great. I think once you speak to someone else in the business, they'll mm -hmm. not only do, do you feel better, it, you feel lighter. It's like a problem shared is a problem halved, but you've also got that person who is almost, they, they're going to have your back. You know, I genuinely believe humans are they have good intentions you know and I think if you share that you're not feeling okay with somebody who you see as that safe space then that's that's who to go to and they will have your back and it will make you feel better and I think mm -hmm. if you are sat there and you're thinking right what can we do in my business my business is thinking you know what can we do where I work to help people because there's not as much you know as what you, we're discussing in the business just brainstorm, go to your employer, have a look online, message me, message Gillian. If you want to talk about mental health in the workplace, it's something that I'm very passionate about and you're very passionate about because you've got to fly the flag for the things that matter. And I think if you've got your voice to articulate it, then you're already, you know, very privileged to be able to do so. So why not use it for something good? Um, but yeah, well, Gillian, I think that's, that's, the wrap up of today I really have enjoyed speaking with you I feel almost a bit emotional and like I just want to go out and make sure everyone that I'm working with is feeling okay, okay. Yeah. yeah and just you know maybe do like a lunch and learn about something and do a journaling session with everyone at some point because I think it is so important that you know maybe that person's been a little bit quieter today and and they need a bit of one-on-one -on -one. or maybe they just need someone to go oh do you want me to go get you a coffee <laughs> sometimes simple things it is indeed well thank you so much for joining us today Gillian thank if you anyone wants to reach out and speak to her about her experience wants to just bounce ideas off her I'm sure you'll be able to find both of us on LinkedIn I'm sure you will Bye. thank you All right. thanks Gillian thanks. bye bye